How many of you can admit you need help spiritually? Now, I want you to be really honest with yourself. You don't have to be honest with the church. I want you to be really honest with yourself right now. How many struggle with sin? How many of you struggle with sinful desires? How many of you struggle staying spiritually minded? This one's going to convict. How many of you sometimes just flat don't want to be spiritual? Come on, have you ever done that? I've done it at church before. I just don't want to be spiritual. Some, I was just fleshly minded or something had me upset or whatever it was. And yes, there's times I've battled that. You know, God knows that we are very weak. In fact, the book of Psalms says, He pitieth us as His children because He knows that we're just dust. So praise God, He knows how weak we are. And God has provided things to help us get our minds back spiritually where they should be. Maybe you're today in a backslidden state. Maybe it's just today that you're not wanting to be spiritual. Maybe there's a move in your life that needs to be made that's keeping you from being as close to God as you should be. You know, God gives certain things, certain uh, wake-up calls, I guess, to bring us back spiritually where we need to be. You know, the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need that constant renewing of our mind or we're going to be thinking like the world thinks. Uh, you can come to church and still be thinking like the world thinks. Do y'all realize Judas Iscariot was there. He heard the words, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He saw the beginning of the Lord's Supper service. He wasn't there to partake of it. But he was there. And you know what he did? He got up and left without changing. Had his mind set, and that's what he went and did. In fact, Jesus said, Go on, go do what you're going to do. I'm afraid there's a lot of people that come to church, they sit through the service, and they leave without changing. They've already got their mind set. There's three ways that I thought of this week that God really uses to renew our mind. Number one has to be His Word. If you will get into God's Word, it will renew your mind spiritually. Number two is His church. He makes us come together to talk about Him, to look at His Word, to be renewed. And I, ho I hope this church does renew you, that you leave more spiritual than you came. Uh, if you don't, I'm not doing something right. Amen? We need to look at what we're doing. And number three, the Lord's Supper. I have been telling you all now for weeks, and, and if you all have gone through the Lord's Supper with me before, you know that this is a ordinance that God put in place to renew us, to bring us back closer to Him, if we use it properly, if we do the examination, if we get our minds right instead of just going through the motions. Now, this is for free. I want you to notice I didn't say God gave us Christmas or Easter to get our minds back on Him. Those are man-made. The Lord's Supper is God-made. Now here's the convicting question. How many of us get as excited about the Lord's Supper as we do about Christmas? Guys, the Lord's Supper is God-made. It's a God-made holiday. You know the word holiday means what? Holy day. This is a holy day that God tells us to come together and do this. Isn't it a shame that we get more excited over man-made things than God-made things? If we will use it properly, this is something that God has put in place to get our thinking right, to get us back closer to Him. Uh, today we're going to look at something that I've, I've looked at with you before, but I've done it really quick. I always do it as a, a conclusion. I've never preached it. The five looks, L-O-O-K-S, of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the focuses that God wants us to be thinking about through the Lord's Supper are where it should bring our mind, bringing us back into the spiritual condition that we should be in. Number one has to be a backward look. The Lord's Supper is a service of remembrance. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He tells us to do this in remembrance of Him. That should be the very first thing that, that where our focus is today. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and let's look at verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, 
that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Verse 24 in chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Say it with me. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it, say it with me, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. Till he come. The first look or the first focus, obviously, is remembrance. I've told y'all over and over and over this word remembrance means putting back into the center of your mind, making him the focus, not just Jesus in general, but what Jesus did for you and me. Guys, we would have no hope without the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. None. There is no hope outside of him. You know, I think sometimes. And it's so sad about the vanity of what is done in the name of religion. Sometimes even we do it. But you think about what goes on in religion today, and it's completely vain. God tells us it's in vain. If we're going to try to be good to go to heaven, that's vanity. It's chasing the wind. Well, I'm going I'm to do the church ordinances. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to get the Lord's Supper. And surely God will accept me then. It's vanity. Those are pictures of what you really need. So many religions today, so many zealots for their religion. There's people killing for their religion. Uh, This next one, I say to our shame, there's people that literally work a full job, but they also work for their religion every day. Going up and down streets, doing all kinds of things. They have a zeal. But as Paul said, it's not based on knowledge. The only hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only hope I have. He's the only hope you have. Dale, what a beautiful devotion you gave this morning. Very simplistic, but God made it so simple. Have you put the blood of Jesus Christ on the doorpost of your heart? Without it, not only the plagues of Egypt are coming on you, much worse plagues are coming upon you. You know, one of my fears, as uh, as Dale sat there and that one of my fears is the people that I love and the people that I'm close to. One of my greatest fears is them not knowing Jesus Christ their Savior. Them being left behind if the rapture... Well, I can't can't imagine if the rapture happened today and my kids were left behind. Wouldn't that... Oh! But even worse than that, guys... Someone you know, you love, maybe even family, dying and being separated from you and God for eternity in the lake of fire. I I can't even... It should be a passion of ours to tell others about the Lord. We'll get there in a minute. But we've got to first remember what He did for us and how important it is. We've got to get that back on our mind. And He gives us this time to do that. We need to remember Him. You know, God has always tried to get people to think back on what they need. You think about the Old Testament sacrifices for a minute. Why did God command those? Brother Dale talking about the Passover meal. And by the way, we see in the New Testament that Jesus is our Passover. He is the Lamb that was slain. Why did God tell Him to do that every year, didn't He? The Passover. Every year. You take this Lamb. You bring it into your home. What do they have to bring in? Two weeks? Four days. They had to bring this lamb into their home, make it a pet, get the children to love it, name it, and then they had to kill it. Every year, put the blood, eat the lamb. Why did God do that? Was it just a senseless killing of animals? I want y'all to turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Hebrews, chapter 10. You know, the Bible tells us that the blood of bulls and goats and lambs never saved anyone. Those sacrifices, think about the countless thousands upon thousands upon thousands of animals that were sacrificed. All that blood that was spilt didn't save one person. Then why did God have them to do it? What was the purpose of every year, once a year, having this Day of Atonement, the the Passover meal? Why did they do it? 
Well, we're going to see in Hebrews, but it was to get their mind where it should be. Guys, there's two things that we need to be thinking today. Number one, we're a sinner in desperate need. We've got to see that. And number two, we've got to see that we need a Savior. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Me and, I, me and my class looked at this briefly today. Hebrews 10 and 1. Everybody with me? I hope I said it right this time. Now I'm paranoid. I'm going to say the wrong verse. Hebrews 10 and 1. The law was a shadow of good things to come. Y'all know what a shadow is. If uh, some of us have bigger shadows than others, if, if Brother Scott was to stand up, I'm not calling you fat, Brother Scott. You're just bigger than I am. If Brother Scott was to stand up, you'd see a shadow cast on the wall. If y'all look over here at Brother Johnny, uh, y'all get, look, look at the wall right past Brother Johnny. Brother Johnny, you can even look. Look what's on the wall. See that bald head? It's on the wall. See it? Everybody see it? It's a picture. It's, it's a dark picture. You don't see it totally like you see the uh, person sitting there, but the law was a picture. It was a shadow of good things to come. Well, what was it a shadow of? And now we're not just talking about the Ten Commandments. We're also talking about the sacrifices. It was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, you cannot separate the law and the sacrifices. The law is there to show us we're a sinner. Guys, if you think you're going to get to heaven on your own and on your own merits, you haven't read the Bible, number one. And you certainly had never tried to keep God's law. Uh, I've broke God's law today. I have to do a little confessing to y'all and my wife. Uh, we were talking in the car right up here and uh, uh, talk turned into, uh, what would you call it? Argue. Not an argument. We didn't argue. We didn't fight. It was kind of a yow-yow for a minute. Y'all ever yow-yow? It was just kind of a snap yow-yow, you know. Uh, and I might have thought some bad thoughts about you, baby. I'm sorry. I confess. <laughs> you probably did too. Have you sinned today? Absolutely, if you be honest with yourself. Please don't say no. You, you just lied if you said no and there's your sin. You can't separate the law and the sacrifices. Right here he says the law, including the sacrifices, were a shadow of good things to come. Look at verse 1. And not the very image of the things. You look at that shadow on the wall, that it, it looks like Johnny, but it's not Johnny can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers therein too perfect. In other words, it didn't save anyone. Look at verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. In other words, if it would have saved them, the first time they killed that lamb, they wouldn't have had to kill it again. Amen? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Uh, by the way, people that don't believe in uh, security of the believer, look what... Look what the writer of Hebrews says about the sacrifices. If that sacrifice would have saved you, you wouldn't have had to done it again. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is, y'all say it with me, a remembrance. Again, made of what? Sins. Why did that lamb have to die? How, how many, can you imagine the children that would cry the day of the Passover? Think about bringing a lamb. Have y'all ever seen a lamb? I'm talking about the, the little, cute little lamb. Can you imagine bringing that into your home? And you know your kids are going to play with it. They're going to pet it. They're going to name it. Can you imagine the day you got to kill it? They're crying. Why? Daddy, why would you have to kill this animal? Sit down and let me tell you why. What a beautiful way to explain our need. For a Savior. Look at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Verse 5. Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, that means Jesus, He saith, Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not. In other words, God didn't uh, sacrifice, wasn't going to get it. But look what it says. But a body hast thou prepared for me. The Lamb of God took on human form and made the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice that brings salvation. Guys, if our mind isn't looking back to that today, then we're in trouble. Y'all can turn back to our text. God wanted people from the beginning, the sacrifices, to remember you're a sinner and you need a Savior. Guys, that's what the Lord's Supper is for today, that we remember we're a sinner in need of a Savior. 
When we see that broken bread, it's not just bread. What is it? It's a picture of the broken body of our Lord. When we drink the fruit of the vine, it is a picture of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is a look back. I hope you've spent some time focusing on what Jesus did. We could have a whole sermon on that, but let's look at number two. Turn back to our text. The next look or the next focus we should have, if the first one was a look back, the second focus is we should have a look forward. Look at what verse 26 says in our text. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we're back in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-six. 26, you do show the Lord's death, say the last three words, Till he come. The very same way that Jesus stood on this earth 2,000 years ago. Are y'all getting this? The very same way he stood on this earth 2,000 years ago. Very soon he's going to stand on this earth again. In the flesh, in his glorified body. Now, I know we know that, but we're talking about getting our focus back on it. Let me ask you today, how often do you go through your everyday life thinking Jesus is going to come back and stand on this earth? I'm going to have to look Him in the face on this earth and give an account for what I've done. He's going to be my Lord and I'm going to bow to Him on this earth. You know, that should make us want to uh, reprioritize what we do in our life. Maybe we should want to do what he said in Matthew, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Now come on, let's be honest. How many of us worry about the bills and worry about the sickness and worry about, can I go down the list? What did Jesus say when he was on this earth? Be not anxious for anything. Don't think about what you're going to eat. Don't think about what you're going to drink. Don't think about what you're going to put on. Quit thinking about the bills. And think about your job. Guys, the day of the Lord's Supper is a day that we should get back to thinking about our job on earth. Uh, boy, I could really preach here for a minute. But it's a shame sometimes when you look at Christians and you look at churches and you can see by their actions where their mind is. And it's certainly not on the return of Christ. It's certainly not on His kingdom when you see some of the things that are being done. Do you believe that He's coming soon? If you believe it, say amen. amen. Listen to what the Bible says. Be ye patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. In other words, get your heart right because God is coming back. Uh, I'm jumping ahead again, but before you can convince somebody else that they need to get their heart right because God's coming back, you've got to get your heart right. Amen? Amen. The Apostle Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Every day having that prayerful attitude that the Lord is coming soon. We need this reminder. You know, I started the sermon by asking how many of you need spiritual help. Guys, I need it all the time. And it's not a bad thing. Spiritual thinking does not come naturally. Uh, I've got to get on my soapbox for just a minute. People come to church in churches today, and uh, if you're not playing uh, big band rock music or having lights and smoke and all this, they'll go to sleep in the pew. You know why? Because they're there for the flesh. They're there to feed the flesh. Spiritual thinking does not come naturally. You have to be willing first, and then God has to do it. It's a supernatural power. Convicting right now, are you right now being touched by the Spirit of God? Can you feel the renewing power of your mind? Or the convicting question, are you Judas? You just going through the motions of the service. Guys, I've been Judas through services, haven't y'all? The book of Revelation says, Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Or in other words, according to what you've done. Do we think about that on a daily basis? That for eternity, my reward is what I've done in this little short time. Are you working for Him daily? Are you really living like He could come today? 
Come on, be honest. We probably wouldn't be caught up in the things we're caught up in if we were living like that. Amen. Uh, Y'all know how the book of Revelation ends? Y'all flip over to the last verse of the Bible. The very last verse of the Bible. I want to ask you if you can truly utter these words and mean it. I love how John ends it. Revelation, the very last chapter. And the second to last verse. Revelation 22 and verse 20. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Now that's what Jesus said, okay? Then John says, Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. Can you utter those words and really mean it? Are you ready for the Lord to come back today? Or do you still have some things to get in order? Guys, if you're sitting here with moves that need to be made, things that God has commanded and you haven't done, unconfessed sins in your life, you can't utter those words and mean them. You really can't. Even as a child of God, you can't say it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? You've got to be very spiritually minded in the right place with God to say, truly, come back right now, Lord. I'm ready right now. Now, I know we're ready to get out of this what's going on on earth. That's not what I'm talking about. Are you ready to stand before Him? Do you have your house in order? Y'all turn back to our text. That brings us to the third look, which is an inward look. I hope you've already seen, we looked at it week before last, the examination process that the Bible tells us to go through. In our text, look down to verse 28 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. God tells us to not eat of the Lord's Supper unworthily, and to do that, we must examine ourselves. The word examine here means to put ourselves on trial, to test ourselves, to trial, to look deeply into our life. We are to hold ourselves up to God's Word and see where we stand. Now, don't get me wrong, I know we're all sinners. But, guys, if you are here with unconfessed sin, and what I mean by that, there's sin in your life, you know it goes against God's command, you haven't repented. You haven't asked God to forgive you. You haven't made the commitment not to do it again. Guess what? You can't take the Lord's Supper worthily. You're not sitting here with a close, good relationship with God. Uh, somebody tell me, what does sin do? It destroys lives, but what does it do with our relationship with God? It separates. Sin is what caused us to be lost in the first place. Amen. And as a child of God, if you sin, you don't get lost, praise the Lord. But what happens? I told y'all last week, your relationship gets strained, doesn't it? Anybody in here ever had family troubles? You're having trouble with a family member? How many of you want to call that family member while the troubles are going on? No. Remember we talked about that? A lot of people don't want to go to church. They don't want to listen to church. They don't want to read their Bible. They don't want to pray when they're in a state they shouldn't be, when there's a move that they know they need to make in their life. You say, Brother Chris, what moves are you talking about? Anything that God has commanded you to do or commanded you to stay away from. You know, there's some that are easy to see. God offers us salvation. Obviously, that's the first move that we should make. God commands us to follow Him in Scripture baptism. God commands us to, uh, that we become a part of an assembly. We become an active a part of assembly. In fact, He says, don't forsake the assembly and yourselves together. But is that the only thing that God commands us in His Word? Love one another as I have loved you. Forgiving one another. Maybe there's someone you need to forgive. Maybe there's someone you're not loving correctly. Are there things in God's Word that He tells us to stay away from? If y'all want me to list everything that God tells you to do and everything He tells you not to do, we're going to be here a long time. But I believe you know if there's a move that needs to be made in your life. 
I can tell you this as a preacher, every time I get in the pulpit, and this can be discouraging sometimes, uh, I don't know everything that's going on in y'all's lives, but I can tell you this, every time I get in the pulpit, there are multiple people that I know have moves that need to be made. Every time I get in the pulpit. And that's been for 20 years. I've known that. And Sunday after Sunday, you go with an empty invitational aisle at the end. That can get discouraging. But you know what? I decided a long time ago, that's between you and the Lord, not, not me. All i got to do is preach it. But I'm telling you, as a friend and as a brother, all you're doing is hurting yourself by not making the move. God wants to be close to you. He wants to bless you if you'll just make the move. It's a time to look at yourself and be honest with yourself. Am I where God wants me to be? Now, I will say this, guys. Don't do it to make Brother Chris happy. Don't do it to make anybody in your family happy. Or by the way, don't not do it to make them, you know what I mean, the opposite either. You look and see what God wants you to do. Amen. And make the moves God wants you to make. Uh, I've told you all before, I'm not a pressure preacher. And maybe I should pressure people more. Because sometimes it boy looks like <laughs> without it, people don't make a move. But that's the Holy Spirit's job to convict you. Uh, believe me, I want to be on some people's doorstep going... <laughs> Are you going to win? Win. But that's God's business. Lord's Supper is a time to look at yourself. Examine yourself. Uh, and by the way, this is, this is for free. Shouldn't we want to make these moves? It shouldn't be, oh, I got to. We should want to. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our God. He's our friend. Aren't we here because we want to be here? Aren't we here because we love Him and want to serve Him? I hope so. The fourth look is an outward look. Once we've looked on the inside and we've examined ourselves the way that God has told us to, again, I could have preached a whole sermon on that examination, but I did a couple of weeks ago, so we'll move on. Let me read out of Matthew when Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper. He took the cup and He gave thanks and He gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is My blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. If you think about Jesus correctly, you're going to change how you look at other people too. If we don't come out of these services with more of a compassion and more of a concern for the people around us and their salvation, again, we've done something wrong. Amen? Did Jesus have a concern for the people around Him? Did He have a burning compassion for their spiritual nature? Shouldn't we as His children have that as well? Uh, look there in verse 26 in our text. It says, For often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, uh, I got off, drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. The word show there means to preach it. You're preaching it. Uh, Brother Johnny said in his prayer that we need to not, to not just be talking, we need to be walking too. Are you preaching the Lord Jesus Christ every day? Uh, until you get a compassion for the people around you, you're not going to have that. You know, I said just a minute ago, it, it kills me to think about the people that I love, no, especially not having a relationship with God. That scares me to death. Brother Mike, asking prayer for this family member. Mm. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. He came to save sinners. It's the very reason He died. Yes, He did it for me, but He also did it for the world. Guys, we as His children need to be spreading the word about what He did for us and what He can do for the people around us. Be honest with yourself. How much spiritual concern do you have for the people around you? How much do you think about it? Through the week, when they make you mad, do you think about their eternity? Do you think about this could be the opportunity to show them the love of Jesus? I've told you all this before, but I believe it with all my heart. Do you believe that God puts people together for a reason? 
Y'all shout it out. Do you believe it? Uh, and I'm not just talking about married couples or church families. I know he does that. I'm talking about every relationship you have, even your acquaintances, whether it's at work or whatever. God puts people in your life for a reason. And I believe the number one reason they're there for you to be a witness to them. Which is one of the reasons Jesus said, love your enemies. Amen? They have an eternal soul, and you may be the only one they hear it from. Uh, this is for free. Quit expecting the lost people to live like a saved person, okay? Y'all understand that? Quit getting mad at them because they're not living like a saved person. Share with them Jesus. Jesus is going to change them, okay? They have a heart problem. Book of 2 Corinthians says, Wherefore, henceforth we know no man after the flesh. In other words, after we're saved, we're not going to look at people the same way anymore. We're going to have a compassion for them. Oh, I say it all the time, it's so easy to get caught up in life, but I want to change that. It's easy to get caught up in selfishness. Y'all know what I mean? This is what I need to do for me. This is what I need to do for my family. This is what I... The people that you're dealing with every day, God has them in your life for a reason, and the number one reason is for you to be a witness to them. Now, I'm not saying you have to go with your Bible tucked under your arm telling everybody they're going to hell. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about you treat them the way God tells you to treat them. You pray for the opportunities to share with them the love of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, and He will give you those opportunities if you treat the relationships the way you should. Guys, think about all the people that are in your life right now, your family, your friends, your acquaintances, your neighbors, your co-workers, those people that don't like you very much. There's a lot of people in your life right now that you have an opportunity to share Christ with. Uh, you know, we look and sometimes we get discouraged. Here we have a, a small number here today. I want you to think, if every one of us would touch the people in our life that God has put in our life, think about how many people that would be. Uh, let me give it to you another way. With all the people in your life, if you would allow God to use you to change three people, three people, now start looking around. If each of us allowed God to change three people in our life, we couldn't fit them all in here, guys. Uh, can I get on to y'all for a minute? I'm getting on to myself too. Sometimes churches don't grow because we're not spiritually minded when we go out the doors. It's our job to be the witness when we leave the doors. Amen? It's our job to bring people with us. I, and I, I do believe that God has put people in your life that are eventually supposed to be members of this church. Do you really believe that, Brother Chris? Yep, I do. That's how you really truly build a church. It's through the membership. It's not through programs. It's through relationships. But we've got to get that selfish minded all that selfish mindedness out of our mind. We've got to quit worrying about the bills and this and that and the other. And seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness every day, guys. Jesus said to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I love that verse. He, he didn't want anybody left out, did he? Uh, have you ever wondered, this is for free too, have you ever wondered why Jesus used that word creature? Uh, prejudice is not a new thing. There were prejudices back then just like there are today. They looked down on the Samaritans. They looked down on, you can just go through the list of people they looked down on. Uh, I believe that Jesus used this to catch everybody. You go preach to everybody. Every creature. Every person. I don't care how you feel about them. You don't need to feel that way in the first place, but go preach the gospel. Walk it and talk it. Amen, Brother Johnny? Amen. Every day. Finally, number five, the last one. Look back at our text and look at verse 24. And when he had given thanks, 
The last look should be a look of thanksgiving. Uh, this should probably be the greatest other than a look of remembrance. You know, Jesus did that twice. He thanked God over the bread. He thanked God over the cup. If we don't come out of the Lord's Supper day thankful, we've really done something wrong. That's right. We should have an overwhelming heart of thanksgiving. Thinking about what God has done for us, what God is doing, and what God wants to do with us. Guys, think about it, and I know we didn't go in depth, but think about the things we just looked at. He died for you to give you salvation. That should give us thanksgiving. He keeps you saved through His life and through His mediation. Wow. And now He is empowering you to live a righteous life in order to be His messenger. He wants to use you, in other words. Wow. We should leave overwhelmed with His with this idea of thanksgiving. You know, the Bible tells us a lot about thanksgiving. Let me read you a couple of things. The book of 1 Thessalonians says, In everything give thanks, for or because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Do you know how God, this is God's will. This is one of those things, one of those God's command things again. God wants you to be thankful every day. Do you know that? Even in your dark times, God wants you to be thankful. And by the way, if you would work on that, you'd be a lot better witness. You know it? You wouldn't be griping. You wouldn't be yelling you know, with people. Be thankful. Please turn to the book of Hebrews with me. Last place I'll make you turn today. The book of Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Guys, I don't think we can describe how thankful we should be for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for what He did, for what He's doing, for what He's going to do for us. Think about all the promises. Think about all that He has done. Uh, we could never be thankful enough. Hebrews chapter 13, look down to verse 15, just two verses. Hebrews 13, and look at verse 15. <clears throat> Y'all know the song, uh, Jesus, Jesus paid it. All, all to Him I owe. Wait a minute. He made a sacrifice. Does God want us to make a sacrifice? Look what it says in verse 15 of chapter 13 in Hebrews. Hebrews 13, 15. By Him, that's Jesus, therefore let us offer, the word offer means willingly, you're giving it up willingly, the sacrifice. Oh, Brother Chris, what do I got to do? You know, some people don't like church, I think, because they think they're going to have to give up a lot of things. Look what God's telling you to sacrifice. The sacrifice of, y'all say it. Praise. Praise. To God continually. That is the fruit of your lips. Say it. Giving thanks to His name. What does God want? He died for us. Jesus paid it all. Now what does He want us to do? Be thankful. Do we serve a great God or what? What does He want us to do? Be thankful. You know, we say things like we should count our blessings. and Oh, guys. Just for what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, thanksgiving should never be off our mind or off our lips. We get upset about some of the silliest things. And I think about the people in the Bible that did give their all. <laughs> they died for Him. There's people in the world today dying for Him. Uh, in that Oregon shooting, there were Christians killed just for being Christians. That's right here on American soil. And think about the silly things we get upset over. The silly things we get consumed by. He wants you to be thankful. Oh, but Brother Chris, you don't know what I'm going through. Whatever you're going through, I guarantee you I can show you in the Bible somebody that went through worse. Mm -hmm. And I can also show you they were thankful. Look at verse 16 here in this text in Hebrews. 
But to do good and to communicate, the word communicate means share, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. When you have a thankful heart, it's going to make you be just the opposite of selfish. It's going to make you realize God shared the things that I have, I only have because God shared it with me. So I should be willing to share that with others. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your smile, your friendship, and your love. Take the time to love somebody. Take the time to get to know somebody. Amen? Take the time to get to know somebody. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. You know, this is probably a really good place to end before we go into the Lord's Supper this afternoon with thankful hearts. If we don't go into the Lord's Supper thankful, we're not doing it right. Amen? He gave His body. He gave His blood that we might have hope. Uh, I wrote this. This comes right out of the new book I was writing. It says, If a reflection on all Jesus did for you does not cause you to be overwhelmed with feelings of thanksgiving and an earnest desire to have a closer walk with Him and to do more for Him daily, then something is terribly wrong. Uh, and then I give the phrase, it, it's a good preacher phrase, uh, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. That means something spiritually wrong with you, amen? If the Lord's Supper does not cause the looks that we just talked about and being overwhelmingly thankful and wanting to be closer for, to Him, then your wood's wet. Something's wrong in your life spiritually. Right now at the close of this service, I pray, and guys, I say this because I know that there always is, and I don't mean to doom somebody, but I pray there's not a Judas among us. Judas was the treasure. Brother Johnny, are you okay? You right with God? I mean a Judas spiritually. Whether it's somebody that's lost here today, or if there's somebody that their relationship to God is not where it should be. Let me start with salvation, guys. Salvation is so easy. God made it so easy. Amen. Maybe today that God is showing you, yes, I need a Savior. Oh, He showed the Old Testament folks through the sacrifices. He's going to show you today through the Lord's Supper. You need a Savior. He came and died in your place. And all you have to do is ask for His blood to be on the door of your heart. But have you done it? Have you called out to Him in repentance and faith? I pray you don't leave this service as Judas did. And then those of us that know Him as Savior, sometime we can get where we're not supposed to be spiritually. Is there a move in your life that needs to be made? I'm not going to list them. I want you to look at yourself. Take that inward look. Hold yourself up to the Bible. Is there something I need to get rid of in my life or is there something I need to do for God? Guys, let's take this invitation time to make those moves, whether they're public or whether they're between you and the Lord. Let's bow our heads together.